Facebook Live. What have you beat? We are closing in five minutes away. Hey, how you doing, sir? One week from today, early voting begins across the state of North and then Dan McCready, military veteran. Tell us a little bit about these candidates. I know you've done extensive reporting on this. So Mark Harris is a longtime pastor. He was the pastor of First Baptist Church in Charlotte, and he is running in his third political campaign. He's run for this seat before unsuccessfully mm -hmm. and for U.S. Senate. Dan McCready is the Democrat in the race, and he is a Marine Corps veteran and a solar entrepreneur, and he's also run a couple other businesses in Charlotte. So he has been running a very uh, centrist campaign, while Harris has been running a staunchly conservative campaign uh, appealing to the uh, base on the right side. Gotcha. And again, Harris is going to be speaking first tonight. He won the coin toss. We were going heads for Harris, tails for McCready. Harris won the coin toss. He will be speaking first tonight again, Eli. Um, different platforms for both of these men. Talk about that and, and where the, the polls stand right now on this. So this is considered one of the best chances for Democrats to pick up a seat. It's been held by Republicans since 1963. Yes. So the 9th District is a very long time uh, conservative bastion. It's one of uh, 24 seats that Democrats mm -hmm. are hoping to pick up in order to flip control of the House. Mark Harris, as a pastor, has made his name as a uh, conservative on right. social issues. Right. He helped lead the campaign for an amendment in North Carolina to define marriage as between a man and a woman. Yes. And that was, um, I believe, started in 2012 and represented a big step for him on the political stage. Dan McCready is a political newcomer, and he said that he was motivated to run in part uh, because of the partisanship that he saw in this country after 2016. So he's run on a centrist platform. Um, he talks a lot about country over party right. and how he plans to bring people together, the bipartisan uh, coalition of veterans in mm -hmm. the House of Representatives. That's one of his ideas. So they present voters with a, with a pretty different choice in the 9th District. And this, this 9th District runs from, what is it, South Charlotte down to Fayetteville, I believe? Right. So we're talking about the area that runs in sort of the Southeast Charlotte wedge down through Union County and out to Lumberton yep. and the Fayetteville area. So it covers a lot of different territory. It covers some conservative uh, bedroom district of Charlotte. It covers areas that are very rural. It covers areas that are um, younger and uh, different demographically closer to uptown Charlotte. So it's a pretty wide ranging district. It's a diverse district and an important one for this upcoming election. We were talking about this before the broadcast. A lot of money has been spent on advertisement in this uh, in this campaign. Yes, and you can see how important this ele election is viewed by the political parties, by how much outside money has come in. Mm -hmm. The candidates themselves have raised a lot of money. Uh, Dan McCready, close to $3 million, right. and Mark Harris, uh, close to a million dollars. But they've had big outside support. For example, uh, the Congressional Leadership Fund, which is a, camp a, a PAC affiliated with House Republican leadership, just announced they're spending a million dollars wow. TV ads starting today. Mm -hmm. Patriot Majority USA, a Democrat-aligned fund, they are spending about uh, 639000 was their new ad. Gotcha. Again, just want to reiterate, Mark Harris will be speaking first. We did a coin toss just a few minutes ago. Heads for Harris, tails for McCready. The coin came up heads. Harris will be speaking first. We will be broadcasting live on WBTV here in a matter of seconds, and we will be watching here. One week from today, early voting begins across the state of North Carolina. Election Day itself is now just 27 days away. A lot is at stake in these midterm elections. All 435 seats in the U.S. House are up for grabs. Right now, Republicans hold the majority with 235 seats. Democrats trying to shift the balance. To do that, they would have to hold all their current seats and win 23 races, last one by Republicans. A good number of races across the country are seen as in play this year. Here's a map of the consensus forecast. And one of those races right here in our area. 
North Carolina's Congressional District 9. It runs from southeast Mecklenburg County into Union and Anson counties and then farther east into Lumberton and Fayetteville. Since 1963, it has been in Republican hands. There was James Broyhill, Charles Jonas, Jim Martin, Alex McMillan, Sue Myrick, and then Robert Pittenger, who will represent the district until January. He lost his bid for renomination in the primary earlier this year. So, no incumbent this time around. You have Republican Mark Harris and Democrat Dan McCready. The winner could very well decide who holds the speaker's gavel in the House of Representatives come January. And that's it. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Jamie Bull. Tonight, WBTV and the Charlotte Observer are bringing you a debate between Republican Mark Harris and Democrat Dan McCready. They are each looking to represent North Carolina's District 9 in the U.S. House of Representatives. And we welcome them both to our studio tonight as they get ready to discuss the issues important to you at home. Republican Mark Harris, Democrat Dan McCready, welcome and thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you for having us. We also have a panel of journalists with us here to ask the questions of the candidates. They are WBTV education reporter Dedrick Russell, along with the Charlotte Observers, Jim Morrill and Cassie Cope. Now, here's what's going to happen tonight. Each candidate will be given one minute to answer the question posed by our panel. We'll alternate who goes first based on a coin toss that we just did before we went to air. Being the moderator, my job is to keep us on time and when necessary, offer time for rebuttal. Those will be limited to 30 seconds. I'll also be asking a few questions along the way that have been submitted ahead of time by some of you at home. We also have WBTV's Alex Giles and the Charlotte Observer's Eli Portillo live in our newsroom. They will be live streaming the debate on our Facebook page and they will be interacting with people watching there. Now, Alex, you were involved in the coin toss. Uh, just happened a few moments ago. Who gets the first question? What was the outcome? And Jamie, we did heads for Harris, tails for McCready. Did a quick coin toss. It did land heads. Harris will take the first question. Jamie? All right, our Alex Giles and Eli Portillo there in the newsroom. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, let's get to it, shall we? Uh, we start tonight with some domestic issues. And as Alex mentioned, uh, we will begin with Mr. Mark Harris. And Jim Morrill has the first question. Hey, good evening. Um, let's talk about federal spending. Uh, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office predicts annual deficits of $1.2 trillion. It also forecasts federal debt of $29 trillion over the next decade. Faced with this, would you raise taxes or cut spending? And if so, where would you cut? Well, I believe ultimately, Jim, that um, the, the answer to being able to deal with that, that national debt is going to really be almost twofold. I think there's got to be growing our economy, and the more that we grow our economy and stimulate our economy, the more we're going to be able to see revenues increase, and, and that's an important piece. But you'll never get out of that kind of national debt and get it under control simply by stimulating the economy without some cuts along the way. And I think there's got to be some, some serious uh, discussions. I think conversations have got to be held as we sit down at the table to really be able to look at the areas that we have to adjust. It's no secret that uh, probably 65 to 70 percent of our budget right now is, is coming through uh, some of those uh, entitlement programs that we talk about from time to time and only 30 percent in the general spending area. But we've got to look at those areas all and see where we're going to be able to make the greatest adjustments. Dan McCready. Well, when it comes to balancing our budget, that's a big issue for me. I'm a uh, person who's built a small business from scratch. I started a company with another Marine that helped build solar farms all across North Carolina. We made our payroll, we balanced our budget, and Congress should have to do the very same thing. Uh, that's why I support a balanced budget amendment in the Congress. But the first thing that we need to do, Jim, toward balancing our budget and getting rid of the deficit is not supporting a 1.9, a tax bill that blows a $1.9 trillion hole in our debt. Uh, this is an area where Mark, Mark and I are very different. Uh, I do not think it's responsible to blow a $2 trillion hole in our debt. A quick response from you, Mr. Well, Harris. Well, you know, I have been long, the long-term supporter of a balanced budget amendment and have said that again and again. 
Uh, and I do think it's important, as uh, Mr. McCready has brought up, the business experience that when you really dig into that solar energy aspect, you find that a lot of that is built on tax credits that uh, actually was the government incentives that were thrown in. And I think that uh, we can't do it on the backs of taxpayers and ratepayers as well. Let's go move to our next question. And can I address that? Oh, please, go ahead. Um, I'm very proud of the business that I've built, uh, helping create a new business from scratch. We helped put 700 folks to work in North Carolina. We did that by working with Democrats and Republicans and built a whole new industry here in North Carolina where we're now number two in the country in solar power. Um, that's something I'm very proud of and that's the kind of leadership I would bring to Washington. Well, let me just try to get specific if I can for just a second though. You both uh, have expressed an interest in balancing the budget, but I didn't hear a specific. What would you cut or which taxes would you raise to actually make it happen? Mr. Harris. Well, I think we've got to look at all of our domestic programs and we've got to look at our areas of where we are spending money that is not benefiting. I, the truth of the matter is our government spending through the federal government is out of control and we have tried to solve every issue and every problem of every individual that is not the role of the government. And I think that's where Dan and I disagree. I don't think that government is the answer. Raising taxes is the answer as he and Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats seem to believe. Can you give me a specific, Mr. McCready? Well, first of all, I've got news for Mark Harris. Mark, I know you talk a lot about Nancy Pelosi and it's in your ads. You're not running against Nancy Pelosi, you're running against a United States Marine and somebody who's built a business from scratch. Uh, the answer to solving our problem with our deficit and our debt is not to blow a $2 trillion hole in it in the tax bill that Mark supports. Let's move on to our next question. Cassie, who has that? Uh, more Americans are reaching retirement age, and experts say that Social Security funds could run out by about 2034. Would you change the current cap on taxes, or would you raise the age for eligibility of Social Security? Mr. McCready, first. Well, Social Security and Medicare, I'm glad you asked about this because this is a uh, critical issue in my campaign. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm highlighting and, and, and fighting for as a, as a very top issue. I was just with somebody in, uh, at the Walmart in Robinson County in the eastern part of this district just a few weeks ago. Sam, who's in his 80s, told me that he's relying on Social Security for his only support of income, and he's praying that politicians don't get elected that'll cut Social Security and Medicare. Um, this is an area where Mark and I are very different. I believe that Social Security and Medicare are rights that our seniors have paid into for decades, and we need to do everything in our power to protect them. Uh, and that means cutting out loopholes for the ultra wealthy to enable Social Security to be sustainable for 75 years. This is an area where Mark Harris has said that he would cut Social Security and Medicare. Mr. Harris. First of all, um, I am highly offended by the fact that it would be said that I would cut Social Security and Medicare. I have never said that. That is a lie that is being perpetrated throughout this campaign and throughout the district that highly offends me. I have always said that we have got to keep Social Security solvent. We've got to be sure to make and make sure that it is a promise made and a promise kept, and we will continue to do that. I do think it is ridiculous for us to ignore the fact that the answer is again, Dan and, and Nancy Pelosi seem to do, we're gonna raise taxes and we're gonna continue to raise more taxes. That's not the answer. I do think we need to look at a graduated system that keeps the promise we've made to those that are uh, retired and are heading toward retirement and are close. And I think when you get further back in the younger years, we need to have a graduated program that may involve options. Let's move on to our next. I, uh, I'm going to give you guys real quick so that. we can try to stay on time here today. Go ahead, Mr. McCready. Quickly. Yeah, I'm going to leave aside the additional comment on Nancy Pelosi. Um, Mark, you can't say that you would not cut Social Security and Medicare when you're very same. Okay, you support a $1.9 trillion tax bill that takes $25 billion out of Medicare. You've said you would join the Freedom Caucus, whose stated purpose is to reform Social Security as we know it. And you said in 2014 at the Lake Norman debate that younger people will be the, quote, big loser, end quote, under Social Security, under your plan. First of all, I have never expressed an overall plan except to make the point that younger people today who do not see Social Security being there when they reach it need some kind of option in place. But we do need to look at real issues that are going to solve real ways to solve the fact that it is no longer going to remain solvent. And so the fact of the matter is, I have again said time and again that we will make sure Social Security is a promise made and a promise kept. 
and we will do just that. Let's move on to our next topic, WBTV's Dedrick Russell. Let's talk about mass shootings. Um, they have been on the rise, spurring more calls for gun control in wake of incidents like Parkland, um, Las Vegas, and the list goes on. Um, what changes, if any, do you support to gun regulations here in the United States? Mr. Harris first. Well, I have said time and again that tragedies like Parkland and uh, in Las Vegas and others, ultimately we have to look at where the breakdown has come. And the breakdown does not come because there is a lack of gun laws, but the breakdown has come because of, of really three key things that have seemed to be a part in the life of every mass shooter that's involved. We, we see that there's a breakdown in the family. We see secondly that oftentimes there's some kind of addiction to uh, violence and, and video games and entertainment. And then thirdly, there's mental illness. I think we've got to begin to deal with those priorities and, and look at the school safety issue, but I don't think it calls for more gun laws because that ultimately is not gonna be the, the solution. Dan McCready. As a Marine who carried an M16 for four years and served overseas in Iraq during the surge of 2007 and 2008, I understand uh, the seriousness that comes with weapons. I also understand the safety that needs to come along with them too. But I'm also a dad of four little kids and every time one of these tragic shootings occurs, which now have become all too often, my wife Laura and I are up, up late worried about the future of all of our kids. So I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I fought to defend the Second Amendment and, and our Constitution overseas, but I also believe that we need common sense ways to keep guns out of the hands of domestic terrorists, domestic abusers, and th those that would harm themselves and others. That means uh, we need common sense background checks so that if a law-abiding citizen has to get a background check, a domestic terrorist can't just roll up into a gun show and buy all the assault weapons he wants. Let's move along. Uh, Cassie Cope, you have our next question. Many Americans are concerned about the cost of health care. Now that the Obamacare or Affordable Care Act mandate has been repealed, how would you expand access and control and lower costs? Uh, Mr. McCready, you're first this time. Healthcare is such an important issue in this campaign, and this is also an issue where uh, Mark Harris and I have very big differences. I was just with somebody uh, the other day, Alita from Union County, who has type 2 diabetes, who has taken the same prescription drug for those two type 2 diabetes for years. She shared with me that she's had to start, the price of that drug went up by 500% last year for her, and she's had to start skipping doses and relying on doctor samples to get by. So the cost of health care and prescription drugs are crushing North Carolina families. But the solution is not to simply kick tens of thousands of North Carolinians off of coverage who have pre-existing conditions like Alita, as the, as the health care bill that Mark Harris supports would do. We need to come together, Democrats and Republicans, and roll up our sleeves, actually work together to take on rising health care costs, doing things like the gover government being able to negotiate directly with drug companies to lower prescription drug prices. Mr. Harris. Well, you know, I continue to be fascinated by how Mr. McCready continues to state my plans when the fact of the matter is I have never suggested uh, in any way, shape, or form that we would move in that direction of not covering pre-existing conditions. I think pre-existing conditions are something that should be covered, and there are Republican plans that are going to bring that forth as well. I think it's important that we understand that in most group policies, that if you actually, within a certain time frame, uh, go on that policy, then you have to be covered as a pre-existing condition. And why would we not propose that we continue to make that available, that once the plan is put in place, if you uh, list your uh, insurance or get the insurance within a certain time frame, then you are covered with that pre-existing condition and then allow the free market to take over and allow insurance companies to offer plans that ultimately the government can provide incentives through tax credits for those that are indeed offering those kind of opportunities uh, for those that would need that coverage. Uh, Mr. McCready, many in your party have called for Medicare for All, sort of a universal health care plan. Is that something you would support? No, I support uh, fixing the broken health care system that we do have by Democrats, Republicans getting together, rolling up their sleeves, and taking on the special interests, the lobbyists, the drug companies, and the insurance companies to lower costs. I do just want to return to this uh, point that Mark Harris just made because it is it's very important. The health care bill, Mark, that you said you support, mm. has been noted by 
countless experts and third parties that it would rip away coverage for people in this district with diabetes, asthma, cancer, and pre-existing conditions. So you can't just use political talking points to get at this. We have to look at the facts. And the fact is, I will protect health care for people with pre-existing conditions. That's a big difference between Mark Harris and myself. Go ahead, if Mr. you want to look at facts, you have to look at the fact that while talking points that uh, the Democrats will, will say about Medicare ignores the fact that the Affordable Care Act took $760 billion out of Medicare, and which has led ultimately to your question, Jamie, that in his party, the party of the Democrats, of which he talks like a conservative, but I'm truly the only true conservative in this race, that the Democrats are the ones that gutted Medicare with $760 billion in order to set up Obamacare. That's what has led to uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez simply asking for Medicare for all, which is what many in the Democratic Party are now seeking. Uh, let's move along if we can. This next question starts with you, uh, Mr. Harris, and it comes from Dedrick. Um, we're talking about, it's estimated about there are 44 million student loan borrowers meaning that the student loan debt is pegged at $1.53 trillion. Um, what, if anything, should the federal government do to address this? Mr. Harris. Well, I think that, uh, again, when we, we're, it's bigger than just an issue that the federal government should step in and somehow forgive everybody's loan. That's certainly not the answer. I do think that it's a problem that has continued to get out of hand. And I think we've got to begin to develop an education ways that individuals when they graduate high school uh, may be able to look at through community colleges and other options of trade school and others rather than racking up incredible debt. There's a lot underneath that issue of the student loan debts that have, have gotten out of control with the rising cost of education. Mr. McCready. It's a really important question and I think it starts with the government should not be able to profit off of student loans. But I want to make a broader point on education because this is an issue that comes up so much on the campaign trail, all the way from Charlotte out to the eastern part of the district. Um, we used to be the leader in education in North Carolina. We used to be known as the leader in the South in education. Um, there is actually an effort by politicians in Raleigh and Washington to destroy public education. Look at where our, how little our teachers are paid now. And I was just with one the other day out in Fayetteville who told me that She's spending hundreds of dollars out of her own pocket to afford to pay for basic school supplies like pencils for her students. This is an area of great difference between Mark Harris and myself. Mark Harris is on the record saying that he would abolish the Department of Education, which would reduce our fair share of federal funds into the education system in North Carolina, make matters worse, not better. Mr. Harris, give you a quick 30 seconds to respond. I have very clearly stated that the Department of Education has lost its, its purpose and its way from what it was founded in 1976 to be, or 77, to be a clearinghouse for programs that made a difference in school. It has become a larger agency. It has become an animal that is eating money, and it is dictating to the states and to the local communities policy that it should not be dictating. And I have recognized that education, we all must agree, the closer control gets to home, the better and more effective education is. A couple more questions in this segment before we have to take a break. Jim Morrill has another one. Uh, you've both been campaigning a lot around the district, the ninth district, and you both know that it's a very diverse district. Places like Charlotte are prospering, and yet you have a lot of rural counties that are struggling. Uh, what can the federal government do for rural areas like that? I think Dan McCready was first this time, if I got my back and forth correct. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. We need a fighter for this district because people are absolutely getting left behind. Uh, there is no place in the entire country that has been more left behind than Eastern North Carolina. Just take a look at, uh, at the, the recent hurricane. You know, I'm, I'm with a mom in a shelter a few weeks ago there with a six or an eight month old baby whose home was flooded in Lumberton. She told me she was there just two years ago after the last hurricane. So people deserve a lot better. One thing that many people don't know is that we're a donor district to Washington, which means that every dollar we send to Washington out of our tax dollars, we're actually only getting 50 cents back. That means that we have not had somebody fighting for our fair share of federal funds in Washington. And one thing I will do will be a fighter for this whole district, but a fighter for Eastern North Carolina and the rural part of this district. Get our fair share of federal funds for infrastructure, community colleges, education, give people some leadership that they deserve. Mr. Harris. 
I think one of the best things we'll do, Jim, is when we understand how we got to this place and how many of those counties that you're referencing down east were left behind. Many of it was the failed policies of uh, NAFTA uh, back when it was negotiated. I, I remember growing up in North Carolina and making many trips to the beach that took us down through those areas. And I remember times when uh, Richmond County and Scotland County and Robinson County, many of those were much more thriving. But uh, through many of the bad deals that were made, of which I must say our president is working hard to make better deals now, uh, all of those counties have paid a price. So I do think that the policies that are passed through our Congress, signed by our president, ultimately can make a huge difference uh, in those districts. I do think infrastructure is an important part, and we've got to make sure that we are champions for those districts. Education, getting them the tools they need, are absolutely critical. Uh, we have one more question, and it comes from uh, Carol Johnstone. She is a viewer who sent in a question ahead of this debate. And for full disclosure, she is a Democrat. And she asked this question. Please explain your views on the role of public schools in our communities, public school funding, and science education including teaching students about climate change and evolution. Mr. Harris, first to you. Well, I, my views on public schools in our communities, obviously, uh, we, I believe in public schools. I'm a product of public schools growing up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My wife uh, is a teacher and taught in public schools. Um, and I believe wholeheartedly. Her mom was a 30-year North Carolina teacher. Her dad was a teacher and coach and ultimately became superintendent of schools. So I believe in public education. Um, I believe it is absolutely critical that we fund it adequately, but I believe we've got to be creative and we've got to be effective and we've got to make sure that we have effective schools. Obviously, uh, Republicans at times have not had all the answers. The No Child Left Behind had some real issues and problems that did not advance where we needed to be. But I do believe that public schools play a key piece in what we're doing. Mr. McCready. It is unacceptable to me that any child would not be able to get a great education in 2018 in the greatest country in the world. Right now, your education in North Carolina depends on your zip code. It's a very different education if you grow up in Southeast Charlotte or parts of West or North Charlotte, or if you grow up in Rockingham or in Lumberton. It depends on your zip code. That's wrong. Every child, no matter their zip code, should have the chance to go to a great public school. Um, that's why it is so important that Mark Harris has said he would abolish the Department of Education. The Department of Education is funding our schools in this district. Uh, a lot of federal funds that we deserve for low-income students and students with disabilities. We need to be able to pay our teachers more, investing in our schools, and be a leader in education in our public schools, not taking us backwards. I'll give you a quick response time. Jamie, he continues to go back and reiterate um, uh, about the Department of Education. Again, I will make clear, the Department of Education has gotten to a place where they are holding our money back if you do not go along with, core, with the things like Common Core and other pieces on education that, that don't, do not fit with what the citizens of North Carolina have wanted. So local control, state control of education has always been the best answer. The closer to home it gets, the more effective education is. And with that, we will end segment one. Let you gentlemen catch your breath for just a moment. Coming up after the break, we are going to dive into some international issues. Keep it right here. Our debate continues in a moment. And thank you to those of you who are watching on Facebook Live right now. We are broadcasting through WBTV's Facebook page and... to you. You can go to WBTV.com slash vote to weigh in. We've got taxes, gun control, social security, health care, and education. Looks like health care and education are the two most important to folks right now. But back to the debate. Eli, what has stood out to you most about this? Well, I think it was interesting that uh, Mark Harris tried to tie Dan McCready to a few uh, national right. figures on the left. He mentioned Nancy Pelosi and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who uh, has called for universal health care and 
farther left positions than Dan McCready has uh, publicly taken. So uh, Dan McCready retorted by saying, um, you're not running against Nancy Pelosi, right. you're running against a United States Marine. I think that kind of shows the strategies that both of these candidates are using. I also thought it was interesting how uh, Dan McCready said, I believe three times, um, this is a position in which I'm very different than Mark Harris. So you saw them kind of trying to uh, uh, put their lines down in the sand and uh, set up for their respective bases and the people they're trying to sway where they stand. They had some sharp policy differences as right. well, and we saw people reacting to that pretty strongly on Facebook, uh, especially around guns and hot button issues like that. You can tell how tight this race is based upon the comments that we're seeing here on Facebook. I just ask that folks keep it civil when they're going back and forth between each other. One person whose comment I pulled out, Ashley Bernicki, said both candidates need to focus on themselves and their stances on these issues, not talking around the questions and throwing digs at each other. I thought that was one. Uh, comprehensive response there from a viewer who is watching here with us. Um, again, domestic issues that matter to you, taxes, gun control, social security, health care, and education. I believe our producer was telling us that they'd already had about 200 people weigh in here. Uh, you can go to WBTV.com slash vote. Health care and education seem to be leading right now. That might change. Welcome back to our Congressional District 9 debate between Republican Mark Harris and Democrat Dan McCready. Right now we want to turn our attention to some of the international issues the country is facing. And Dedrick Russell has our first question. Um, first up, um, do you support the administration's zero tolerance policy on immigration? And by the way, do you think there, uh, what do you think about the path to citizenship? Mr. McCready. I'm glad you mentioned immigration because I think this is about the best example out there in the whole country of where Washington is broken. I think it's no secret what we need on immigration and we need what's not happened for decades, which is Republicans and Democrats to get together and work together toward a bipartisan, comprehensive immigration reform. And I agree with probably 90% of Americans that that's a reform that should do certain things. So first of all, it should secure our border. I understand that as a Marine who has served overseas, we absolutely need a secure border. Um, second, it should be a a reform that respects our laws. Some folks that are here now should have the opportunity to get right with the law and then get to the back of the line. And third, it should be a comprehensive reform that upholds our values. No more ripping kids away from their parents at the border. Um, that's something that's not consistent with our values. I'm someone who will be fighting for Republicans and Democrats to come together and work on this hard problem on behalf of people in North Carolina. Mr. Harris. You know, there's a, uh, I, I do agree that the immigration issue in America is huge and it is a broken system and there has got to be the reform. I do think that there was a compromise that was put out on the table by the president that was uh, really a great compromise and that was the four pillars, if you will, uh, that would lead to DACA residents uh, having a pathway to citizenship, a pathway to legal status seemed to be the, the conversations through that. And that was to number one, build the wall. Um, and people say, well, we can secure the border without building the wall. I just believe there's too much evidence that where pieces of the wall have been built, that the numbers are staggering of how much lower they are of where people are coming across illegally. Number two, that we end chain migration, that the individuals that are vetted and come, that they come and bring immediate family with them, but they don't extend out as far. And then I also think that we've got to end the visa lottery, and I think ultimately that we've got to make sure that E-Verify is being employed. Let me follow up with both of you if I can. You mentioned path of citizenship for those with Do in DACA. There's tens of millions, right, that we think are in this country illegally right now. What about them? Is there a path to citizenship for them, Mr. Harris? I think that once the border is secure, and I think once we have in place that and we know that we're dealing with, we do need a system where we bring them out of the shadows, where they are able to pay a penalty, pay back taxes, be able to learn English, be able to uh, integrate into our culture and society. And I genuinely believe that yes, there could be that opportunity, but it cannot begin until we secure the border. Mr. McCready. Uh, I agree that as part of a bipartisan and comprehensive immigration reform, part of that should be some folks who are here, as I mentioned earlier, should have the opportunity to, to get right with the law and then get to the back of the line. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's move on to our next question. Cassie Cope from the Charlotte Observer. We've been at war in Afghanistan for 17 years. Do you see a way out? What should the United States do? Mr. Harris, first to you. 
Well, I believe that uh, we, we need to continue to have our generals and our folks on the ground continue to bring the wisdom and the advice of what is happening there. I think our president uh, listens to them, and I think that he is wanting to make the best decisions. We've seen what can happen when you pull out of an area too early and you leave a vacuum. I think most uh, people agreed that ISIS really got their stronghold when our troops were, were drawn down, pulled out, and left that opening there. So I do think that uh, we, we need to seriously understand the circumstances of what is happening, and we do need to make sure that we bring stability to that area in that way. Mr. McCready. This is a question that's very important to me because I began my professional career uh, serving in the, in the Middle East, leading a platoon of 65 Marines. I understand how serious it is when you commit troops to war, but I also understand that we need a strategy. I would argue that we have not had a national security strategy in this country as it applies to Afghanistan or anywhere else for at least 15 years. We didn't have it when I was in Iraq. We didn't have it under President George W. Bush, President Obama, or President Trump. We need a strategy that on the one hand uses our military might, but also combines that with our economic strength and our diplomacy and our work with our allies so that when we commit troops to war, we do it with overwhelming firepower, destroy the enemy, get the job done, and then come home. No more of these long-running 15-year wars. I wanted to get to a question that came in again from uh, one of our viewers here, and this is from Neil Gaiman. He is a registered Republican from Waxhaw. And Mr. McCready, I'm going to have you answer this first. He says, tariffs have done more to hurt American businesses instead of helping. I own a small business that now has to raise prices on my products because of tariffs. What will you do to pull back tariffs and look at how we can fairly trade with other countries? It's a really important question because, unfortunately, um, there are a lot of people in this district that are being negatively affected by the tariffs. Um, another example is I was just with a soybean farmer the other day out in Robinson County who's being, being really hurt by the tariffs. I do credit, credit President Trump, though, with, uh, with starting an important conversation, which is, in my view, Democratic and Republican administrations for decades have not stood up to China on trade. And we have a situation where American businesses, especially small businesses, American families are at a disadvantage versus, for example, Chinese uh, subsidized enterprises. So my issue is not the conversation that's happening to stand up for North Carolinians on trade, but it's in the execution. I think we do need a comprehensive approach that levels the paying field on trade, also deals with very serious cybersecurity threats from China. Uh, and then also stops the theft of the intellectual property of American businesses. Mr. Harris. You know, the tariffs, uh, all of us, I, I think, uh, certainly as conservatives, have, have felt like tariffs were something that uh, were not a long-term solution. And I certainly believe the president uh, is demonstrating that he doesn't believe it's a long-term solution, but has been a, a, a real direct negotiating tool that has helped. I do think that we have seen Europeans come to the table very quickly, moving toward a no tariff uh, policy. Uh, we have seen what happened with Mexico and now Canada and how our dairy farmers are benefiting from the renegotiation that took place there. And that has helped set the stage for the now the approach to China, which has been the goal all along. That's where the playing field has been most disproportionate. And this president has made a commitment to do that. I do think that our farmers are uh, feeling an effect. But what I hear from them is they're patient with this president. They understand the overall vision that he has. And we're seeing opportunities come even for soybeans that no one actually saw would even be coming. I want to turn our attention now to just some of the recent headlines uh, that we have seen certainly around the country. And Cassie Cope has our next question. This past Sunday, the Carolina Panthers saw their first football player kneel during the national anthem. What do you think of these protests? Mr. McCready first. As a Marine Corps veteran, uh, I stand for the national anthem. I stand out of respect for uh, our veterans, out of respect for our, our first responders and all who have uh, served our country. At the same time, I'm a white guy. I've not faced discrimination, and I understand that someone next to me may kneel and may do that because he or she doesn't feel heard. Um, I think what we need to do in this country is come together as Americans and condemn the racism and evil. I think it is a uh, tragedy 
and it is sad when you have white supremacists and neo-Nazis marching in the streets of Charlottesville, one of our historic southern towns, and we can't come together and the politicians in Washington can't actually condemn racism and evil by name. Mr. Harris. You know, I think that um, what it really does is speaks to the values that we've lost in the culture. I think it speaks to the fact that um, we should stand out of respect for the flag. Um, issues and how people feel and, and political issues, uh, there's, a, there's a place that we debate those, there's a place that we carry those out. But the flag of our United States of America is something that all Americans should, should appreciate, should honor, and should respect. And I think that ultimately um, that's, that's the problem with what's happening with the kneeling. And uh, my plea and uh, my encouragement uh, would be for all of us to stand united, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, and be able to stand in respect for the flag. I have a couple of questions that are going to be individual uh, to, to each of you right now. Mr. Harris, I want to start with you. As a Republican, Mr. Uh, President Trump, I should say, obviously also a Republican, give me one issue in which you do not agree with him. Well, I, I would say again, uh, going back to the tariffs, um, I, I think I certainly have had uh, a bit of shakiness when we went down that road uh, because I've been a free trade individual and believe in free trade and believe it is, it is crucial. I've also come to understand in the midst of it that uh, fair trade is critical because the more I've learned in the process, the more I've seen that we've been looking at uh, free trade in the rearview mirror for a long time and it's been missing and that, that we're trying to level the playing field. But I am concerned about tariffs and I, and I do feel like that it is something that we've got to monitor, we've got to be careful with it and we've got to make sure that, uh, that we maintain not a trade war, uh, but that we do maintain the relationships that we have. Uh, Mr. McCready, the converse of that, give me something that you would agree with the president on. Well, I agree with the president uh, that he has started the conversation on trade, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I, don't, I don't disagree with you, Mark, that the execution um, as part of the president's trade plan has not been strong, but I think it is important to level the playing field for American workers and American businesses that are not on a level playing field vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, let's move along. A couple of more questions that Jim Morrill has, and again, we'll start with Mr. Harris. Okay, Mr. Harris, uh, as you know, the special counsel's investigation has been going on for over a year now. A lot of Republicans say it's time for it to end. Uh, do you agree with that, or would you support efforts to continue it until it plays out? Well, you know, Jim, I think it, I think it is playing out, and, and I would hope that it is drawing to a quick conclusion. Um, there has seemed to be no evidence to this point of, of collusion, which again, uh, when this whole thing was started, it was supposed to be narrow in scope, and, and as oftentimes happens, it just continued to get broader and broader and broader. Um, I do think that, uh, that it has gone on long enough I do think it would be in the best interest of the country for it to draw to a conclusion. If there's something that's happened, then let's hear the report and let's deal with it. If uh, they haven't been able to find the evidence, then I believe it's time to shut it down and bring that report to the American people so that we don't spend an entire four years of an administration uh, dealing with this kind of special counsel investigation. Jim, go ahead. A related question, Mr. McCready. Uh, there's, uh there's likely to be an effort, if Democrats take the House this fall, uh, to begin impeachment proceedings, proceedings against the president. If you get elected, would you support that or would you not? These kinds of decisions are very serious decisions, Jim, and they're decisions that uh, need to be handled based on the facts and the evidence. Uh, as a small business owner, uh, I don't deal in hypotheticals, I deal in the facts. Uh, and, and that is a decision or any decision related to our Constitution that I would treat very seriously based on the facts at the time. I, what I will say is this, we have got to end the partisanship in Washington. Washington has become so broken, it is so dysfunctional. People get up there, I think with good intentions, but it becomes all about whatever their party leader says or whatever the special interests say or, or whatever they have to do to get reelected and, and get money, and they forget about the people in North Carolina who deserve better. That's why I've said since day one that I will not vote for Nancy Pelosi. I wouldn't vote for Paul Ryan either. I simply think that we need new leaders 
on both sides who can take us past this partisanship that is killing us so Democrats and Republicans can work together again and get to work for people in North Carolina. All right, uh, we have time for your follow. Go ahead, Jim. Follow that up. Uh, you say you, you won't support uh, Ms. Pelosi for speaker, and yet Republicans say that you've taken a lot of money, you've gotten a lot of money, a lot of money has been spent on your behalf by a group that's associated with her. Uh, what do you say about that? Do you feel, would you feel obligated because of that money? The only people I feel obligated to fight for are people in North Carolina. Uh, and look, this whole thing for me, Jim, is, is not a career. If you'd asked my wife, Laura, a year and a half ago, she would have told you we were perfectly happy spending time with our four little kids and continuing to build my clean energy company. This is a calling I feel to serve again, much like I felt that in the years after 9-11 before joining the Marine Corps. We have got to get a new generation of leaders to Washington. So I have not taken a dime from Nancy Pelosi. Uh, I will not support Nancy Pelosi. That's nothing personal. We need new people up there. We need some new blood. Who I look forward to working with, should I have the honor of serving, are the post 9-11 veterans who are running all across this country. There's people all across this country who, like me, didn't plan to do this, but feel very convicted of the direction our country's headed. And I plan to form a caucus with those post 9-11 veterans, Republicans and Democrats, so they can work together and actually get things moving again for people. Mr. Harris? Yeah, I would like to respond to that because I, we hear oftentimes Mr. McCready talk about the importance of bipartisanship. And, and I agree with that. I, I've spent my life working with people from all walks of life, all different perspectives, bringing them together to work toward a goal that is bigger than themselves. But I think that there is a certain uh, naivete, if you will, to think that you will go to Washington as a Democrat and not support Nancy Pelosi, who frankly is spending that $350,000 that you're referencing, Jim, to run negative ads against me. In fact, I think I heard that I was the third, uh, ranked third in the country in the amount of negative ads that Nancy Pelosi's PAC has spent. There's a reason for that, because if Mr. McCready is elected, he just represents a number that would move the Democrats toward a majority. If they become the majority, Nancy Pelosi has already done the math. She will be the speaker. Maxine Waters has the seniority and will become the chairman of the Financial Services Committee. And this is just part of a reality that I think we all have to deal with. Yes, we want bipartisanship. Yes, we want to work together. But there are certain political realities that all of us in the Ninth District have got to face. And this is one of them. Uh, Dedrick, I know you had a question uh, about Which the speakership. Let, let me ask this question first, and then I'll give you a chance to respond, okay? Go ahead, Dedra. Yeah, since we're talking about Speaker, um, Mr. Harris, you've said that you would support someone like um, Jim Jordan of the Freedom Caucus. Um, do you still stay with that, or is there someone else you would back? I, I have said repeatedly uh, that, that even when I made the statement about Jim Jordan as him being a name and an individual that, that I could support, there have been three names that have been mentioned by Republicans very clearly, and that is Jim Jordan has been mentioned, Kevin McCarthy has been mentioned, Steve Scalise has been mentioned. I believe in my heart that any three of those men would be superior any day of the week to Nancy Pelosi, who we have seen in action in that speaker chair. Now, the way it works, and everybody's got to understand it, the, after the election, Republicans will go, we will meet in caucus, and we will choose the nominee that will be speaker. The Democrats will do the same. And then we will come together and whoever holds the majority, their person is likely. So Dan McCready will either vote for Nancy Pelosi if she's the nominee or vote for the Republican. And I'd be curious if he'll do that or he'll just abstain. I mean, that's, that's the options. Uh, let me go back to you, because there were questions about money that you, your campaign has used or has been used in your name, I should say, and also the speaker. So go ahead. Well, again, I've not taken any money from Nancy Pelosi. Um, I'm starting to believe, Mark, that you think you're running against Nancy Pelosi. You're running against Dan McCready. I want to focus, though, for a moment and step back on this conversation, because it is important that the voters understand there is a dramatic difference on the ballot in terms of how Mark Harris would work for people in North Carolina and, and, how, and I would. Mark Harris represents the same kinds of extreme and divisive and partisan politics that have gotten our country where it is. He has said he would join the Freedom Caucus. The Freedom Caucus is the most extreme caucus in the Congress, which Mark Harris has said he would shut down the government if he doesn't get his way. He's on the record saying he would shut down the government if 
the, go uh, the government doesn't defund health care. I don't believe in that. I believe in putting country over party and working with both sides to get the job done. Real quick, would you shut down the government? I have said that there, there are times that when we're looking at votes, and, and it's not a matter of having my way, but if it's a matter of voting and moving bills forward and spending bills, if it comes to a point that, that the spending bill is going to do more damage than it's going to do good, then yes, there comes moments in time, as the president has made clear, that we have to take a stand uh, in order to get things accomplished. And with that, we are going to take a pause, a quick break, much more when we return. And thanks again for watching here on uh, WBTV's Facebook live stream, also broadcasting on the Charlotte Observer's live stream. A lot of interesting topics in that last segment. Eli, heard a lot of mention about Nancy, uh, Nancy Pelosi in that one. Yes, um, even though it was a segment about foreign policy, you could see uh, both candidates trying to tie their opponent to a bigger outside group. For uh, Mark Harris, he tried to tie Dan McCready several times to Nancy Pelosi, uh, talked about spending by outside PACs. And uh, for Dan McCready, he tried to tie Mark Harris to the Freedom Caucus, uh, the farthest right caucus in the House of Representatives. So you saw how there's bigger issues at right. play here, and we are seeing a, a contest really between uh, larger forces. Um, I believe the line from Mark Harris was, you know, if the Democrats win, Nancy Pelosi will be speaker, and this Dan McCready will be helping that. Dan McCready basically said, if Mark Harris wins, the Freedom Caucus will be in a better position, and he might shut down the government. So so they're talking about the issues, but they're also talking a lot about bigger outside groups, outside spending, and things outside the 9th District. Absolutely. A lot of back and forth between the two candidates, a lot of back and forth here on Facebook. One of the questions I got thrown out about kneeling and Kaepernick, and we saw people going back and forth. Tanya Silverthorne said, I have multiple family members who fought and would tell you they did that to give us the right to uh, kneel or stand. Mark Kino said, stand out of respect for the flag, our country. All are welcome here. All can succeed and God we trust. But just, you see the split there. Uh, we've been asking folks to go on to WBTV.com slash vote. Tell us what issue is most important to you. Eli here and I are going to keep uh, tracking the comments. Back to you. Welcome back to our debate as we continue to talk about the issues in North Carolina 9 as we get closer to Election Day, less than a month away. I want to kind of piggyback on what we were just kind of talking about, if we can. And, and Dana McCready, I'm going to start with you because party labels have become an issue in this campaign. To you, what is a Democrat? For me, the most important things in this campaign are fighting to protect Social Security and Medicare for our seniors that have paid into those programs over decades. Um, making sure that we're creating opportunity that moves North Carolina forward, like the 700 jobs I've helped create, helping build out a new industry in North Carolina in, in clean energy, um, but also taking on our national debt. Uh, those are things I'm proud to fight for, although I don't think that anybody should go to Washington as a Democrat first or Republican first. They should go as Americans first. I think that's what we're missing. You do have a D by your name, however, so why did you choose that party? Well, it's for those things I just mentioned. I'm not hiding the fact that I'm a Democrat. Um, those are very important things like protecting Social Security and Medicare, I think, are rights that our seniors have earned. Those aren't entitlements just to be put at risk with the, the tax bill that uh, Mark Harris and the Freedom Caucus supports. Mr. Harris, let me ask the question of you. You're a Republican. Why? Well, because I believe that the Republican Party, as uh, I have experienced through the years, at age 14, I was dropped off at my, my, my parents at the Americans for Reagan office established by Jesse Helms in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and uh, cut my teeth there. You know, I believe as a Republican, it's very simple. We believe in limited government. We believe in shrinking the size of government. We believe in a strong military and a strong foreign policy. Uh, we believe in a, in a party that, as Reagan put it, if you're going to build a strong America, it's like building a three-legged stool. You've got to have a strong domestic agenda. You've got to have a strong foreign policy. 
and you've got to be strong on social issues. And, and he said, if you try to break off any one of those three legs, that stool will not stand. And so for me, that's what it means to be a Republican. Is this still Ronald Reagan's Republican Party today, though? Oh, I think at the heart of it, and, 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 and shrinking the size of government, government limiting government, lower taxes, uh, all of those things, yes, are still at, at bay. The personalities have changed, but, but the, the facts and the foundation, I mean, the, the Democratic Party is this party that met in Charlotte in 2012 and removed God from their platform. Um, and, and that was, and we all heard that vote. So things have changed. The Democratic Party today is not the Democratic Party of my grandfather was in. Um, and I think, again, that's just the changing dynamics to your question. Uh, real quick, Mr. McCready, do you want to respond to that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, too. I would never, you know, challenge anyone's faith. All right, we will move on to the next question here. We have a, one more from a viewer at home, and it comes from Brian Clark. He's unaffiliated. Uh, he is from Matthews, and he asks this. With all the rancorous partisanship, partisanship excuse me, in Washington at present, what are some issues which you believe you could compromise with congressional members on the other side of the aisle? Mr. McCready, first to you. We've got to cut taxes more for the middle class. Um, I supported very much the middle class tax cuts that were part of the, the, the tax bill that passed last year, but we needed to do much more of that. Uh, give less of the tax cuts to Warren Buffett and the Koch brothers of the world and more to hardworking teachers, firefighters, and, uh, and, and families that deserve a lot better here in North Carolina. Mr. Harris, where can compromise be found with Democrats? Well, I think um, there's been a great misrepresentation in what's going to happen with the tax bill that Mr. McCready said he would have voted against in December and multiple times has attacked me for voting for it. Uh, we saw a, they raised the standard deduction, raised the child tax credit. Um, that did not have any Democrat support, I might add. So I think if we're going to find areas that we work together, I, I think the immigration issue ultimately needs to be an area where we work together and, and, and meet together and accomplish those pillars I talked about earlier that, that I think, you know, lead to legalization, lead to a pathway uh, for these individuals to uh, coalesce into our culture. Uh, we're going to come back, take another quick break. Closing statements from both when we return. All right, back here live uh, on Facebook Live via WBTV's Facebook page and the Charlotte Observer Facebook page. Eli, that was a quick segment there, and we're heading towards the end of the debate. So far, what have been your big takeaways? Well, there's been a lot of talk of bipartisanship. Um, not surprisingly, there's bipartisan support for bipartisanship, yeah. but yeah. I think we've seen some very uh, starkly different issue uh, stances on the issues between these candidates. And um, you know, that was uh, that was an interesting segment there because we saw some some pretty personal exchanges between right. the candidates there. And I know we got a lot of reaction on uh, on the Facebook page as well. Yeah, we've seen people weighing in all night on Facebook, uh, sharing their opinions, uh, suggesting yeah. some questions. I think it's interesting that we had uh, all this talk of bipartisanship, right. and we saw on the Facebook page we've been seeing a lot of uh, pretty starkly partisan comments. Um, if there is an indication of the division in North Carolina's 9th District and the country as a whole, it might just be in this social media stream which we have here. That's a very good point. I feel like we've yet to see somebody say, oh, I think both are doing a great job. I think either would be a great candidate. You know what I mean? Yes, uh, we've definitely seen some pretty sharp partisan attacks, and um, I think, you know, on social media that tends to be amplified, but I think it's also a reflection of what is going on um, in the country as a whole and in this district uh, in particular. A good point there. We've been asking folks all night on WBTV.com slash vote which issue is most important to you, taxes, gun control, social security, health care, and education. Earlier, health care and education were leading. We're going to have to see if that is still the case when we wrap everything up here in about, I guess, five minutes or so. But for Eli Portillo, Charlotte Observer, Alex Giles, WBTV, enjoy the uh, closing statements. And welcome back. It is time now to wrap things up. We have time to give each candidate one minute for a closing statement, and we start with Dan McCready. 
I don't think there's anywhere in the country where there's more of a difference on the ballot than there is here in North Carolina's 9th District. And I think the viewers tonight have heard about how dramatic those differences are. Just a few that we've talked about tonight. I will fight to protect Social Security and Medicare for our seniors. Mark Harris said people under 50 are, quote, the big loser, end quote, under his Social Security plan. I want to take on the national debt. Mark Harris supports a tax bill that adds nearly $2 trillion to our national debt. I support strong public schools. Marcus said he would demolish, demolish, he would abolish the Department of Education. Um, I believe Democrats and Republicans should work together. Mark Harris just said tonight that he supports sometimes shutting down the government. In my platoon, we all wore the same color uniform. We didn't care about where you came from, who your parents were, the color of your skin, or even your political party. That's the kind of leadership I think North Carolinians are ready for. And if I have the honor of serving, I'll do everything in my power to work together to get the job done for people in North Carolina. Dan McCready, thank you. Mark Harris. Well, I'll tell you what, it came to the end of the debate for us to recognize something we agreed on, and that is that uh, there's a direct opportunity to choose very different paths in, on November 6th. Um, the fact of the matter is, I'm the genuine conservative, and you know where I stand. I've stood in this community and, and throughout this area for a long time. Dan McCready talks like a conservative, but the reality is his presence will be another vote for Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats. He says that, am I running against Nancy Pelosi? Well, sometimes it feels like I am since she has spent $350,000 in ads against me. But I can promise you this, I'll keep the economy moving. While we'll keep the economy moving, Dan, Pelosi, and the Demo Democrats will wreck this economy. We do have a choice on November 6th. And I'm asking for your vote on November 6th, Mark Harris for the United States House of Representatives. Mr. Harris, uh, thank you. And thanks to all of you at home for watching tonight. And gentlemen, appreciate you being here as well. Safe travels on the campaign trail uh, over the next month. The decision's now in your hands at home. Early voting starts next week, October 17th, Election Day, November 6th. WBTV and the Charlotte Observer committed to keeping you informed all the way through. Again, we appreciate you being here tonight. Have a great evening.